class for this year. And today's session, of course, is Cultural, Heritage, and Environmental Preservation. It hadn't been the year in that we expected, for sure, but I wanna thank everyone for being very flexible and continuing to participate with us. So I wanna give you a few housekeeping and um, technical items. If you're not the speaker, if you don't mind muting yourself, and you do that by moving your mouse to the little um, bar at the bottom. <clears throat> that way, if your dog comes in to visit, or your phone rings, or you have some background noise, it won't interfere with our speakers. So if you are gonna ask a question, you have two ways to do that. You can, again, go to that bar at the bottom, and you can click on chat and type in your question or you can hit the participants button down there and at the lower right hand you see the raise <clears throat> your hand and then Ann will see that and will know to call on you with a question. Any other um, technical tips Ann that we need to go over? <clears throat> Uh, you pretty much covered everything. Just don't forget, um, we have a lot of people on the line right now, and it is easy to pick up some background noise. Uh, so please, if you're not presenting, just keep your line muted. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce and thank our two steering committee members who coordinated this day, and it's Maria Salter and Vicki Ladner. And Maria is a realtor with HL Properties, HL Raymond Properties. She's also the manager of training and development at the Scarlet Pearl Casino. And Vicki is a closing agent and paralegal at Pilger Title Company. So I wanna thank both of them because the agenda and our speakers today were coordinated by the two of them. And they're gonna take the program over, the class over from here until we get to the end. So Maria, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, hey everybody, how's it going? I know everybody's pretty glad, I'm sure, to finish up this session, right? Um, so we, like, like Sally already said, we've got a very busy agenda ahead of us. Um, and first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna learn a little bit about St. Rose de Lima Catholic Church. Um, and just to kind of open it up about St. Rose, um, we've got Marilyn, who is a parishioner, a lifelong parishioner from St. Rose, who's gonna tell us about um, all of the, the history about St. Rose and why it's so special to us. But uh, St. Rose is a spirit-filled church. If you've never been there, you need to go. Um, it's got, it offers exceptional worship services, uh, and the, the parish of St. Rose de Lima is a very diverse group of believers who take pride in their ethnic heritage, um, and it shows with the uh, design and the decoration and, and the physical interior of the church. So what originally started off as a school, um, over a hundred years ago, uh, it was the first school for African American children, and it was opened up in 1868 with 24 African American children. And then uh, in 1895, around there, the Divine Word missionaries were a group of religious priests and brothers, originally uh, from a German congregation who had come to Techni, Illinois, in the United States, uh, and they they moved south to establish an African-American men's priesthood um, school. Uh, they uh, were not really welcomed where they were in, in the South, as you can imagine, during that time in the Bible Belt, uh, above, uh, actually not the Bible Belt, my bad. Um, they, were, they were not really welcomed in the seminary at that time due to the racial climate. Uh, so the seminary was transferred to Bay St. Louis in order to be near a more Catholic atmosphere. Um, and then what we now know as St. Rose de Lima Church was actually built in 1926. So uh, let's hear a little bit from Marilyn 
uh, about St. Rose de Lima. Anne? Hello, class of 2020. My name is Maria Salter, and I'm a graduate of the class of 2016. I'm here today in front of St. Rose de Lima Church, and we're going to take a tour of this beautiful little church and learn about how it helped to shape the community of Bay St. Louis. So are you ready to take a virtual tour with me? Come on, let's go inside. Hi, everybody. This is Miss Marilyn, and she is going to tell us a little bit about the history of St. Rose de Lima Catholic Church. And Miss Marilyn, uh, I guess a good starting point would be how was the church founded in Bay St. Louis? St. Rose de Lima Church was started in 1926. Well, it was built in 1926, and it started with um, the priest from the Divine Word Missionary, uh, Father, Father Christmas, or uh, whoever the first principal was at St. Rose was the one who uh, had us to open our doors. Uh, our parents, our grandparents were, had to go to Our Lady of the Gulf for their training. And I guess it became too much and we needed, uh, it was the, the voice of the people, of the parents, of their parents, who wanted them to have their own church. So it was requested and it was built. And um, from there, uh, we grew St. Rose de Lima. So Ms. Marilyn, tell us about how this started as uh, predominantly a black Catholic church. There were no seminarians or men who had been trained to become priests um, in this area. So the St. Augustine priests, they, those who wanted to become a priest, had to go to uh, somewhere else to be trained. They started a seminary in Greenville, Mississippi, but they had been run out of that area. So they came to Bay St. Louis. I guess it was in the, the dark of the night, they slid in here. <laughs> and uh, this is where they uh, had their training. Um, they were also, the priests who were there became the, uh, the priests at St. Rose de Lima. Marilyn, what can you tell us about this beautiful portrait of Jesus? This is um, Christ in the Oaks, commissioned by Father Kenneth Hamilton. He, there, we had a choir member by the name of Catherine Fitzpatrick, who was a student of the artist, Ossicles Ozos. So Father, Father Ken asked uh, Catherine and Ozos, if they would do this, this painting of Christ in the Oaks. And the people he chose to pose in this, this art piece were people from the community. So this community and others, because from what I can understand, uh, other body parts of other people were, were uh, painted into this. And my son actually was one of the, the models uh, for this portrait. And, and other people, I don't know who else was, but I know it was said that other people's body parts were put into this. It was, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, isn't that amazing how uh, the Bible tells us that the church is not the building, but it's the people. And so here is a great display of how the church has many bodies uh, and, and each one <laughs> plays an important role. So we've got somebody's hand with somebody's, somebody else's foot and 
uh, it's just an amazing demonstration of uh, the, the church. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, so over here, I know we've got Father Ken's face. Yes. Can you point that out for Father us? Father Kenneth Hamilton. This is this is his face. The priest who was here at that time and who commissioned this painting. Beautiful. Okay, so we've got some unique uh, wood here on the altar and the pedestal. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so I'm, it must have been after Camille when um, these, this driftwood was found on the beach by St. Stanislaus. So Some of the artists from the carpentry people mm. from Bay St. Louis, members of this community, they, they found the wood, they prepared it, they stained it. So this is called the tabernacle stain. That was a piece of driftwood. This is the driftwood that was found at St. Stanislaus as well. And this is our main altar. This piece is called the Ambo, which is also found on the beach. I know today, this is such a great, culturally diverse part of Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Uh, and I hope you get to come and, and experience it for yourself soon. Ms. Marilyn, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us about this church, and God bless you. Thank you, too. All right. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of great aesthetic appeal to St. Rose de Lima Catholic Church. Um, it's a wonderful place to worship, uh, and, and people like uh, the Manning family, uh, worship there when they had their camp in past Christian and I've been told by Miss Marilyn that the choir for St. Rose actually performed at Eli Manning's wedding. So very interesting part of our community. Uh, we love St. Rose and, and everything that they believe in and hope you get to experience worship with them soon. Um, I think next on our agenda is Anna Roy to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, tourism in the Gulf Coast and how we've been impacted by, uh, by this pandemic. And so just a little bit about Anna is she was born and raised in Brussels, Belgium, and she attended the European School of Brussels to earn her bachelor's degree in French and politics at the University of Manchester, UK. She also received a master's degree in translation at the University of Leeds, UK. Uh, having met her Alabaman husband in Madrid, Spain, and with several years of experience in the hospitality and tourism industry under her belt, Anna moved to Jackson, Mississippi, where she took on the role as guest services manager at the historic Fairview Inn. Four years later, Anna and her husband moved to beautiful coastal Mississippi, where she became the public relations media manager at Coastal Mississippi in 2017. Uh, Anna's work at the Regional Convention and Visitors Bureau focuses on promoting the Tri-County region as a tourism and convention destination worldwide, developing awareness programs to drive journalists to experience the secret coast as a destination for leisure and business travel and maintaining constant communication between the organization and elected officials, stakeholders, and the community. And something that Anna did not include in her bio is the fact that she speaks five languages. And that's pretty amazing. I can barely manage one. So uh, Anna, the, the show is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and thank you all so much for having me. Um, I wanted to give you a little kind of overview of the travel and tourism industry right now. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. I think it's a disabled participant screen sharing. And is that... 
Is there a way to enable that? Okay, try it now, Anna. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, so just to give you a little overview of um, of what we do at Coastal Mississippi. Um, Coastal Mississippi is a destination marketing organization uh, charged with promoting the three coastal counties of Mississippi. So Hancock, Harrison, and Jackson counties as a tourism and convention destination worldwide. Its mission centers on attracting ever increasing numbers of leisure, convention, sports, and business visitors to the area and is dedicated to maximizing the travel and tourism industry for South Mississippi. So my job is pretty awesome. I get to promote our 62 miles of coastline, three amazing counties, 12 distinct cities and communities, tons of different opportunities for exploration and really just such an amazing and diverse region. Um, so I'm very, very thankful to be here. Uh, now on to the more nitty gritty. Um, so the travel and tourism industry right now during COVID-19. So as a as a general U.S. overview, the U.S. Travel Association releases reports on a weekly basis. This one was released on May 21st. Um, they reported that national weekly travel spending rose slightly to $3 billion last week, which was actually the highest since the week ending April 4th. Um, so lockdown measures are continuing to kind of ease off a little bit. People are traveling a little bit more. Um, but it was still registered as 86% below last year's level. So that's an $18.9 billion loss right now. Um, since the beginning of March, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in over $176 billion in cumulative losses for the U.S. travel economy. Um, it's, you know, it's hit pretty much every industry extremely hard, and the travel and tourism industry is one of the biggest ones. Um, and then to give you just kind of a regional level, coastal Mississippi, um, I've got some numbers just for the non-gaming properties um, in, uh, in terms of occupancy and revenue. Um, just to give you kind of an idea right now, um, so the total loss percentages compared to 2019, in March, occupancy was down 37.6, revenue was down 40.3, then in April, occupancy was down 62.4%, and revenue was down 72.8%, so quite steep there. However, there is um, some hope at the end. There's a light at the end of this tunnel. Um, we're starting to see in different studies that people are starting to consider travel again while restrictions are being eased slightly. People are really starting to consider it. Um, so half of the respondents of the Longwoods International study um, said that the, they'd visit friends and family do domestically. Um, 76 percent, so three-fourths, would travel by car and a quarter by plane. Um, of those who had already made travel plans within the last six months, with, with it, within the next six months, 26 percent had changed their destination to one they can drive to. Um, for us as a drive destination, already prior to all of this, around 80 percent of our visitors were actually um, drive-in visitors from a, from a six-hour radius. So we're in quite a good position to welcome more drive-in visitors. Um, Louisiana is our number one visitor. Mississippi is actually our number two. Alabama is number, no, Florida is number three and Alabama is number four. So we do have a huge drive-in market. Overall, 86% of travelers plan to visit a domestic destination. People are not thinking so much about international travel right now. And 2% plan on taking a staycation, which is great for us because we've got quite a lot of great places right in our backyard to visit too. Only 8% did not intend on traveling during the next six months. So this is just kind of breaking it down as an overview. People, 20% of those plan to travel by car to see friends and relatives within 200 miles. So again, our drive-in destination, that's, that's, a really, that's a really big one for us. And we are optimistic that we're gonna be um, a pretty sought after destination, not just because we're driving, but we also are pretty, um, we're way less overcrowded than a lot of other nearby destinations, and we're also relatively affordable too. Um, destination Analyst is another one that um, comes out with some reports. This is um, the American Traveler Sentiment. This was released May 25th. 
Um, people are feeling comfortable, but not necessarily confident. So a lot of American travelers are feeling um, not so confident about personal finances or the national economy, but um, their feelings on the impact of that is actually at a 10 week low. So people are feeling slightly better about it so far. Memorial Day weekend, as we saw, we actually had a lot of people um, visit, um, but generally on a national level, um, only 5.9% of American travelers um, surveyed responded that they were gonna take a trip. Um, actually 42.7% of the people that were making a trip decided within the last week to book. Um, but they did also find that nationally, 95% of the American population believed it was too soon to travel. Um, and we, you know, we're seeing that people, again, are looking at taking a staycation rather than a large full-blown vacation this summer, and a lot of people around a third are going to wait until next year, 2021, to travel again. We also see in this survey that travelers are exhibiting a strong trust in DMOs, so destination marketing organizations such as ourselves. So they're looking for trustworthy resources, and they're looking towards the tourism bureaus, and in fact, the tourism bureaus came second behind friends and families as the most trustworthy source of whether you know a place was safe um, and and ready for their visit. Um, people are reacting to the new protocols. People want to know that health and safety is prioritized everywhere. Um, they want to know all of this, but it does still stimulate some anxiety for a traveler too. So with our ad agency, we've been creating a roadmap to re-entry. So there are four phases of this. The number one was wait. So that was when the shutdowns were happening, people were being quarantined and shelter in place, um, things like that. And the second phase is acclimate. So when some restrictions are lifted, um, but there's still the reality of that financial impact. Um, third phase is the consider phase where Travel is deemed safe again, but with precautious measures and people are slightly less fearful of traveling. And then the fourth phase is when the industry is fully open again and safety precautions have been eliminated. We're currently kind of in between the two and three phase right now. So we at Coastal Mississippi, we had to kind of really think about this. You know, what is our brand purpose? What um, value do we bring to people's lives? How do we understand and acknowledge and address what people want when they, when they visit us? Um, we need to consider why they're seeking to travel, connection, productivity, well-being, entertainment, escape, personal improvement. So in order to connect with our audiences, um, we have our um, positioning statement um, that's right here. And I, I will be giving a PDF version of this um, presentation afterwards so people can really read through it. Um, but just it, within our positioning statement, you know, we're a destination of charming and welcoming small towns. So again, not that over-touristed um, destination. 62 mile shoreline, so lots of place to roam, lots of space. Um, exciting and laid back. It feels like family. People feel comfortable here. Um, it's reviving and relaxing in equal measure. So um, we developed the Coastal Mississippi Promise of Health and Safety, um, basically to prioritize the fact that um, it's important our industry partners take the vital steps um, to make sure that employees and visitors are safe. Um, we've drawn from the recommendations developed by leading agencies, um, so the CDC, Mississippi State Department of Health, and the industry guidelines developed by the U.S. Travel Association as well. So our Coastal Mississippi promise is as follows. When you visit the Secret Coast, you'll be met with warm welcomes and 62 miles of shoreline dotted by unique coastal communities. Here you can expect excitement and relaxation in equal measure with plenty of room to roam. You should also expect to see that our hospitality partners are implementing all necessary precautions to protect you and your loved ones. Our industry has been equipped with comprehensive recommendations from leading agencies, and we are actively working with regional healthcare authorities to ensure the best practices in health and safety are provided to our industry partners. So breathe easy knowing that your health and wellness of our hospitality industry employees is top of mind for us. We hope you enjoy your experience in coastal Mississippi when the time is right for you to visit. And we've actually had local health authorities sign off, off on this initiative as well, um, including Memorial, Merritt, and Singing River. Um, 
again, this is reinforcing the priority of, you know, health and safety of employees and visitors. And it's also allowing for potential visitors to see this and make informed decisions when they plan their trip um, to the Seagrate Coast. And with that, I just wanted to share some of the content that we've been putting out, you know, ever since this kind of started, we've been thinking of, you know, new and fresh ways to put out content that's inspirational, aspirational. It, it allows people to explore the area. There are virtual tours, blogs, um, jigsaw puzzles. We have a comprehensive quarantainment guide, um, loads of different things. We're really trying to find unique ways to showcase the region um, without people having, without people being here right now. And um, just to keep the destination top of mind for when people do decide to book. And you can see all of those on coastalmississippi.com. And then we also have very, um, some great social channels on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we're again, sharing those blogs that we have on our website, but also, um, you know, putting out some great videos, lots of different kind of surveys and challenges. And, you know, we're getting a lot of engagement for that too. So again, just keeping our destination top of mind, um, making sure that people know that we are still here and we're still ready to welcome, welcome people back when they are ready to visit. And um, so, yeah, so if, if you aren't following us already on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at MS, and on Instagram, we are at MS. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you very much. And thank you all so much for making this place just the special place that it is, because really the number one asset of this region is the people. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> And we really appreciate you, Anna, and all the information that you've been able to, to give to us in a very condensed period of time. Um, the Mississippi Gulf Coast is definitely the secret coast. I know I'm, I'm originally from the West Coast, and uh, I, I think the West Coast people don't know what they're missing here in Mississippi. It's pretty amazing. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Anna? And we don't appear to have any on deck either. Okay, Anna, I guess that means you've done a phenomenal job uh, yeah. at, at telling us about the impact of COVID-19 on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and tourism as it is. Um, and if there's, if there's no further questions for Anna, we're gonna move right along to Vicki. Uh, and Vicki is going to tell us a little bit about our next speaker, which is Brennan Thomas. And take it away, Vicki. Thank you, Anna. Hey, class. Thank you, Anna. Hey, class. Um, just want to introduce you to Brennan Thomas. He is with Ecological Asset Management. He's going to speak with you today about environmental consulting and restoration projects that they are actually working on. Um, right now. So with that being said, um, we'll let Brennan start speaking to you. There we go. Hey, everybody. I think y'all can hear me. Yes. 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 All right. Perfect. Sorry for the informality. I'm out on the beach right now, actually getting ready for our next restoration project which is in Long Beach and actually the entire Harrison County area. What we do is, you know, we focus mainly on trying to restore dunes and just any of the uh, areas of the beach that will help with things such as first off beach erosion and um, second off just such problems as many of you may know, if you drive down the coastline, there's always a pile up of sand on the beach from eroding out on the beach. Well, what we do is we're gonna be going through and in this project, we'll be planting 100,000 plants along the entire beach on in Harrison County. And there will be future projects that will actually go along with this to create more. But what they, they have done is focused on areas that have been bad with the sand blowing up on the beach and with just areas where the beach has eroded ever since the restoration of the destruction from Katrina. So my job is pretty cool. I get to, you know, I get to be out. It's of our work to 
wetland delineations and surveying where we go out and we actually survey full pieces of property, find wetlands. We use a, a scientific process of testing the soils, the plants, and just the actual hydrology and drainage of the area and determine where wetland our restoration division where we have gone through and actually went out to ship island where i don't know if a lot of you know that they actually filled in the gap they dredged millions and millions of tons of sand from out deep, restored that whole beach, and then we came through and planted three, which will then grow from the bitters. I can't use that's in the, the funding to all this will actually be um, is some of the issues that have been popping and blowing on the beach and things. So, you know, we will I think what we'll do is, um, since we've lost Brennan, I think we just have a bad connection with him being outside. Um, Maria, you think we should just move on? Absolutely. Speaker. And Vicki, could you maybe text Brennan just to let him know if you're able to okay. do that? Okay. Yeah, so, I don't know it's my connection that's messing up, so yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, it's, I think it's just because he's on his phone and he's out. In the, at the beach so yeah it looks like he's got the best office out of all of us right now <laughs> we're all jealous but <laughs> so I, I just heard that the king of spain has been quarantined on his private jet i guess that really does mean that the rain in spain stays mainly on the plane <laughs> I miss that. okay our next speaker is uh, very special not that it, all of you are very special, of course, um, but we've got with us today uh, Brigadier General Joe Spragans, and I have some stuff about Joe, General Spragans. Uh, he is the Executive Director of the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. Uh, General Spragans grew up in Alexander City, Alabama, and graduated from Troy University with a bachelor's degree in resource management. He served 34 years in the military and attained the rank of Brigadier General. Uh, he retired from the U.S. Air Force. Aim high, General Spragans. I'm also an Air Force vet. Um, Prior to joining the DMR, he served as commander of the Combat Readiness Training Center in Gulfport and was the chief of staff of the Joint Forces Headquarters in Tennessee, in the Tennessee National Guard. General Spragans was appointed Director of Emergency Management, Homeland Security, and the E-911 Commission for Harrison County. He began work days before Hurricane Katrina made landfall on August 29th of 2005. And now we've got the privilege of having him here with us on our Zoom conference. So thank you, General Spragans, for visiting with us today. And we look forward to hearing what you've got to say to us. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How y'all doing? I hope everybody's fine. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to try to share a screen if I can. And uh, I'm going to put it over here and see if it will let me share it. Did that work for everyone? Can you see the screen? Did it come up with the Mississippi River Flood Control? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, we're going to talk about the uh, Bonnie Carey mainly in uh, the Mississippi River. 
And I don't use this slide just to show you a few points of what happens and why the Mississippi River is so important. Uh, to give you a little background, the Bonnie Carey was uh, designed and built. And the Bonnie Carey, if you can see my pointer, if I can get my pointer to work, hang on, is going to be right here in this area. Can you see where I'm pointing? Where the gold area is? Yes, sir. Okay. That's the Bonnie Carey. It was built in 1931. And it was designed to divert water from New Orleans. And uh, what they were looking at was trying to uh, basically divert the water from New Orleans to keep it from flooding the city of New Orleans. It has 350 gates, and it's, about, it's capable of putting out around 250,000 cubic feet per second of water if when it's, all the gates are open. And uh, which is, uh, if you just get an idea, that last year in 2019, there was over 11 trillion gallons of water that came through the body carry. So uh, that's quite a bit of water. Uh, but to, they're basically there to help uh, to operate. And then they operate whenever we get, basically, if it's, uh, if you go to New Orleans and you look at it, and uh, there's a levee there, and it's called the Carrollton Gauge. And when it gets to around, used to be 20 feet, now they're going down to 17 feet. When it gets to 17 feet on the levee, they start getting concerned and they shut down the Bonnie Carey to a point to where you can only work within uh, 1,500 feet of it. Uh, you have to be at least 1,500 feet away from the shorelines. This is uh, the reason for that is because of issues that happened there and uh, they for the safety of the people working. But they built the thing to be able to operate maybe you know once every five to 10 years. And obviously we'll go through some things uh, where that's happened a little bit different over the last few years. There was also another diversion that was built in uh, 1954. And if you see my slide, it's up here in this area and it's called the Morganza. It's a red area that you see coming down. If you can see that to the north of here, it's around Baton Rouge and uh, just north of Baton Rouge. And they built it in 1954. It has 125 gates and can be uh, a maximum of 600,000 cubic feet per second. And it's mainly diverts water down the Chapalaya Basin, and, and which is this area here, which you see in the red. And it mainly diverts the water into that area. And it was built in uh, 1954, and it was basically to help uh, relieve any flooding or anything in Baton Rouge in that area. Uh, the, uh, the, if you look at the Bonnie Carey and you think about it, and if you could go way north, of which I don't have it on the uh, slide here, but there's a place called Cairo, Illinois. And when you get to Cairo, Illinois, you can see, it, which would be in just north of there, and just think about Illinois, about the middle of the state, 90% um, of the water that's going to get into the Mississippi has already reached that in the Mississippi at that point. So you think about the Mississippi, and you think about us, and you think about the state of Mississippi only, usually in Louisiana. But 90% of the water that comes into the Mississippi has already reached the Mississippi River by Cairo, Illinois. So what that amounts to is you have to look at it, and a lot of things happen. There's a lot of different rivers that run in from the Missouri and other areas. Uh, you look at it and you think about, okay, what happens. But in the time, that, like last year in 2019, we had the Bonnie Carey that had to be open twice. And the first reason it was open was because of the Ohio Valley which is over to your east, and uh, the Ohio Valley area was uh, flooded, and all the flooding came in and basically came down the Mississippi River. Well, that closed in the end of, uh, and around the end of April, and then around the middle of May, we had to open back up, and that was because of the Missouri River. And the Missouri River and the Arkansas River all were, had flooded, and it was to the point of the amount of rains that we had from that area which was unprecedented, the first time in history that we'd ever opened the Bonnie Carey twice in one season. And obviously uh, we've got to, this is the third, this year was the first time in history, we keep breaking records and I hope we quit soon because I'm tired of breaking records with the Bonnie Carey. But uh, we had never opened it twice in one year, in, uh, in two seasons year back to back, two years back to back until last year. Well now it's three years back to back we've opened it because we opened it this year. So it's, uh, it seems to be going in the wrong direction, I would think, and uh, what's happening. But if you look at the map and you think about what's happening, when the water basically gets in this area, 
Uh, if you can think of 2,100,000, uh, 2.1 million cubic feet per second, that's uh, what it was last year, you know, at, at one point to when it reached that point. But it, the only reason it did not open at that point at the, as a uh, Morganza, everybody says, why don't they open the Morganza? Why don't they open the Morganza? Well, it didn't open at that point because the, uh, right at the time that they was thinking it was going to reach a 1.5 at Morganza, and what you, we were talking north of here, there's a lot of area here that, that the Mississippi River has capability of reaching. But uh, if, just to give you an idea, Vicksburg was 2.1 and 2.2 million cubic feet per second. But by the time it reached Morganza, it had gone below 1.5 million cubic per second. A lot of that happened because the levees in Arkansas breached. And when the levees in Arkansas breached, it caused the water to be able to disperse more. Uh, other people ask questions. They say, well, you know, with, with the water, all the, uh, if you noticed this year, it's still underwater. Been underwater the whole year since January. It's basically the, uh, the if you want to call the area around uh, Vicksburg North, just say north of Vicksburg uh, in the Delta. Uh, most of it has been underwater with water all the way to the levee ever since January of this year. And it really doesn't matter how much we open below there, the water's still going to go in the same spot in those areas. And uh, it, it's kind of a, something you would think about, well, you know, if I open the drain on the other end, maybe I'd get the water come out. Well, that's not the way it works. The water has to reach certain points and it makes so many turns into the river that uh, it basically would back flood anyway, no matter how, if we opened up both of these, the Bonnie Carey and the Morganza, if we opened them up both all the time and it was flood was gonna happen, it would still flood the Delta. So it's kind of interesting that it's a little different than normal. Uh, the Atchafalaya, just to give you an idea, there's a little spring just north of where I showed you the Morganza and it's called the old river structure. The old river structure operates year round. And there's an average of a little over 100,000 cubic feet per second going through the old river structure every day. And that's to keep the water, the river from flooding. And uh, it goes down the Atchafalaya. People think we do not have the, the water going. They think it only comes to the, uh, the Bonnie Carey and then they open it and let it come into Mississippi. That's not 100% true. Uh, they, they have a lot of it, over 100,000 cubic feet. And, and during times like uh, when the flooding was and when the Bonnie Carey was open, there's over 200,000 cubic feet per second going down the old river structure. Then if it gets to a point that we can't keep it to 1.5 million cubic feet per flow for the flow at uh, Morganza, they open the Morganza, which can capability of going up to 600,000 cubic feet per second that it can relieve. So to give you that, the, the Bonnie Carey itself is a, uh, not the only structure that's open, it is rare. It's opened. Uh, it opened. Open. It was only opened eight times from 1931 to 2008. And then since 2008, it's opened up in 2008, 2011, 2016, 2018, twice in 2019, and then 2020. There's more things than just uh, what's happening in this part of the river that's causing it. You really need to look north of here. Uh, a lot of those changes have happened up in the Ohio Valley and those areas. And uh, what has happened is that the, uh, the river itself has been, uh, levees have been built to protect different areas along the river, just like we did in New Orleans and uh, like they do in Baton Rouge and other areas. The levees have been built to protect it. And anytime you take a river that naturally would flow out and go, uh, you know, miles to the east or west, and you restrict it to where it's only going a half of a mile to the east and a half a mile to the west, then it basically can, and can brings it together. And when it brings it together, the river flow becomes faster. And that's what's happening to what's going on. And, uh, you know, everybody fussed at Louisiana, but Louisiana is not the cause of it. It's way before it ever gets to Louisiana is where the cause is happening. Uh, we've asked the Corps of Engineers to look at it. We asked them to do studies for us, and they are doing a study now. And the state is going to look at all the river structures that are south of, of Vicksburg, basically. And it's called the South Mississippi River Structure, and, uh, or the, south, uh, the Mississippi River itself. And so we're looking at it, and hopefully we're going to get some ideas. One of the thoughts that we have is, okay, we realize you're opening it up here at, at 100,000 to 200,000 cubic feet per second, the old river structure. 
But what about if we opened up the Morganza, if we just opened it up 10%, 20%, and allowed, you know, 100,000 cubic feet per second to go down it, what would that do to keep the, the, from having to open up the Monte Carey? And we don't know those answers. And so we're asking the Corps of Engineers, and, we've, and uh, they've been funded to do this. And they're going to do a study, which probably take about two years, to tell us if they opened up this, what would it do below there? Nobody, I don't think anybody in uh, Mississippi or anywhere else is out to flood someone else's home. And that's what we're looking at. And if you open it up too much, you could flood like Morgan City and Franklin and those areas down New Iberia, they would flood out, mainly Morgan City. It would basically be underwater if we had put too much down the Atchafalaya. And uh, they have areas that they've built there, but it's not something that, uh, that we could afford to be able to allow that type of water. If you put a, you know, 600,000 cubic feet of water down the Atchafalaya on top of the 200,000 cubic feet that you're putting in the um, old river structure, uh, you can get an idea if you open it up for 30 days or 40 days compared to what we had last year. And uh, we was open to 123 days, but in two different times, and we had over 11 million cubic feet. You can imagine the millions of cubic, uh, 11 billion, you can imagine the, the amount of cubic feet of water that would go down to Chafalaya. And we only opened up to like 212 gates. So we did never get to 250,000 cubic feet per second. And that, that just gives you an idea of how much water is going there. But that's a, a kind of an idea of what happens. Uh, and uh, obviously, you're welcome. I'll take, you know, uh, you want to wait till the end to do questions? No, sir. If we've got anybody that has any questions for you now, we'd love to, okay. love to hear some answers. So we'll open that up for questioning to everyone. Hmm. I'll tell you what, it's amazing. I never really thought about it. When I lived on the West Coast in California, um, you don't, I guess you just don't realize the impact that uh, a body of water in another state will have on your state. You know, I certainly didn't understand all of that until I moved to the, to the South, to Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Gulf Coast, but uh, it's, it's amazing the impact that another waterway can have when it's you know, so far away. Well, it's another thing. You know where the you know where the Mississippi River starts. In Is this Canada. a trick question? <laughs> well, the answer's in Canada. It starts in Canada, and uh, so if you think about it, there's 32 states that the water out of 32 states feed into the Mississippi River. And uh, if you think about the snowfall, and you think about the snowfall that happens, if we have record snowfalls in the north especially central part of the United States, and uh, even Colorado or Ohio and that area, those areas when the ma massive snowfalls, they got to melt eventually. And when they melt, the water's coming to the Mississippi. And mm -hmm. so that causes some other issues for us to be able to uh, have to look at. I mean, uh, we're now, the Mississippi River the, the, uh, is down below flood stage. But when you say that, that's below Vicksburg. It's not below flood stage at Vicksburg. It's wow. still above flood stage. So uh, it's just a matter of uh, time, and, and we're going to still see more water coming from the north to Vicksburg area. It's just by the time it gets here, it's not at the, you know, the flood stage by the time it gets to the old uh, river structure or wherever uh, south of there, it will not be at flood stage unless we have a massive rainfall to go with it. General, but, yeah, I'm sorry. General Spragans, this is Tish Williams. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today and give us that update. You know, when, when the Bonnie Carey Spillway first opened up, people were very upset. They said, you know, it's killing our seafood industry. You know, where do we stand today with, with those, those uh, thoughts? Well, just to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, you know, the last year was so devastating. If it opens up in February, March, and April timeframe, if the Bonnie Carey opens up and we keep it less than 200,000 cubic feet per second flowing, it's usually gonna cause us minor damage, not major damage. But when it opens up like in 2011 and then last year in, the, in uh, 2019, when it opens up in the May timeframe and June timeframe, the water temperature is so high into the Gulf and to the Mississippi Sound 
that it cannot absorb it. The, the aquaculture itself and the, you know, cannot absorb it. Marine life will die from it. And so what happened last year, we lost about 80% of our shrimp. We had about an eight, I'm talking as far as the amount of uh, the shrimp that would normally be caught in the Mississippi Sound. We, uh, our oysters was 100% devastated. We had, uh, and, and I, I, I say 99.9 .9 because I say they always that one oyster hanging on a uh, seawall somewhere over there on the Western <laughs> Gulf I didn't know about. But uh, we lost 99% of our oysters in the Western Gulf and about 70% of our oysters in the Eastern Gulf because it came all the way over. The first time in history it's ever came past the, the flow from the, uh, Bonnie Carey coming past the, uh, what they call the, Gulf, uh, the Gulfport ship line, ship lanes. That's the first time in history it's ever, and it went all the way to Pasadena. And so that gives you an idea of how much uh, the water south of Deer Island last year had zero salinity in it. And that's the first time that's ever happened. And so that's what caused the devastation. So we did lose a lot. Now, we have been given funding. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, we were, received 2.1, 21.3 million, excuse me, 21.3 million was given to us by NOAA to be able to help to replenish what happened in the 2019 Bonnie Carey. So we're in the process now of looking at that, but a lot of it will go to rebuilding the structures itself because we have to rebuild the oyster beds. And I, we put a million dollars, excuse me, a million oysters into the water. I'm talking live oysters we bought out of Texas and we put them in the, in the water this spring so they can spawn and they've already spawned and hopefully we'll be able to uh, rejuvenate our, our oyster beds with that. And that's what we're working on. The crabs will come back. They're just going to take a little smaller time, uh, uh, less time for a young crab. It, it just doesn't, uh, it grows pretty quick. You know, a year's time it's grown and you can have a crab. An oyster takes two years. From the time that oyster gets onto some shell somewhere and grows, it's two years before it's markable size. And so we're definitely lost a tremendous amount of uh, seafood there. Now, as far as the fish, we didn't lose that much. We're concerned. We're waiting to see what happened with the speckled trout because the speckled trout does spawn into the bays and all, and the water was so fresh. I'm not, we, we're really concerned about where the right amount of spawning happened and uh, whether it'll, it'll basically hurt our speckled trout. What we are doing, though, we just turned loose about 600,000 uh, fingerlings of speckled trout a few months ago, and so we tried to grow them and turn them back in from uh, up at Lyman to help there. But uh, the money is here, is in the bank, as they're saying, so we're trying to set up with NOAA to be able to tell us how to replenish it. Uh, as far as the uh, actual other seafood, we're seeing the shrimp are coming back. Matter of fact, we open shrimp season tomorrow with when we'll open it up this year. That's earlier than we, just about any time as I can remember that we've ever opened up shrimp season. And uh, so that's a good sign. Shrimp come back year after year. So hopefully we'll be fine with the shrimp. Uh, then we'll be, uh, the, the other food, seafood is fine. The crabs are coming back. The, uh, the oysters is gonna take us a couple of years. I, I can tell you right now, we won't have an oyster season this year and we probably won't have one maybe in the fall of next year. If everything works perfectly, we'll be able to have one. Now we Thank are doing all bottom, which is different than you think. The all bottom oysters, and we are growing those. I'm sorry, Tish, I cut you off. No, I just said thank you. I know you, you had told me that you had another appointment at four, but one last thing I wanted to add, and I'm sure there's there could be some other questions too, is um, thank you. We just recently received notification from the National Heritage Area that we are the recipient of a $10,000 grant that will enable us to put a visitor center, much like what we did at Lazy Magnolia, and some of the people on this call were part of that. I see Steve Barney, he was part of that. Uh, and we're gonna put one at Buccaneer State Park this year, thanks to DMR and the National Heritage Area Grant Program. So thank you for that. Well, and we also gave uh, uh, Wildlife $2 million to help you rebuild Buccaneer. Wonderful. So uh, we're gonna help you with that. And Perfect timing. You. Yep, and we're gonna help you rebuild Buccaneer State Park. You know, Buccaneer is the, uh, only state park on the Gulf Coast. And it's the, you know that it's the most profitable one in the state? Yes, it is. 
So, uh, yeah, we, uh, matter of fact, I've got quite a few projects that uh, have been given to me, requests for Go Mesa and Tidelands funds for this next year and uh, this year, this year's funds. But uh, so hopefully we'll get some of those. We're waiting, uh, working with the governor. But uh, I think there's several places like Diamond Head and other places that need some uh, projects done and there's several others on the beach. So hopefully we can help y'all some more. Thank you. Maria. And, uh, if that, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I'll try. You've done a great job, and thank you, General. Well, thank y'all. I appreciate it, and uh, y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. You too, sir. All right. Our next speaker uh, is no stranger to our community either. Uh, she's come in and, and has revitalized the Hundred Men Hall. Um, Rachel and uh, forgive me if I don't pronounce this right, Dangermon. <laughs> um, so Rachel and her son, Tin, uh, are the new owners uh, bringing the Hundred Men Hall into the future. Um, she's a writer and facilitator working, who was working in New Orleans and was drawn to the Hundred Men Hall because of its, its historic presence um, as an energy center for African-American music and social history in Bay St. Louis and Rachel, the call is now yours. Okay, I am uh, just gonna give this general caveat that I'm operating on a 15 year old computer, so my sound quality is not close. Can you hear me? You can't hear me at all. Okay, am I muted? No, we can hear you better when you lean forward a little bit. Okay, so I hate to get my face all up in here, but I'm gonna have to do that. And as you can see, this background was done by my son, so that wasn't my creative idea. Um, okay, can you hear me well now? Yes. Okay. So, let me just start by saying this. When I purchased the hall, my intent was that I had been an investigative reporter for more than 20 years, and my career was, you know, spiraling downward, as all journalists' careers have been, uh, because of the cultural free that the internet created. And so when I bought the hall, my intent was to do writers' workshops and artists in residency. Um, but it was after buying the hall that I realized what this place was and how special it is. And, um, and every day I learn more and more about it. And it really is a very, very, very unique situation. This is one of the rare African-American landmarks that are still standing, um, other than churches, um, which are maybe not in as good as condition as this, it's, it's a hundred year old piece of history. It also um, is one of the few standing buildings on the Mississippi Blues Trail. And um, so it's, it's got so much history to begin with and that it's situated right here is no mistake. Um, it, it's um, location next to New Orleans um, is very um, influential of the music and the style that was played and created here. And um, but I want to talk about why it's here. Um, in 1894, uh, 12 African American men created a um, an organization to help with uh, death and burial and medical uh, expenses in their community. And they did this because they didn't have access to insurance through white-owned uh, businesses. And so it was in dark times that they created a situation to help. They then, uh, one of the men who was a member of this original 501c3 nonprofit that they created, uh, worked on the railroad. And he saw that this property was for sale and he bought it for $100. And they began having gatherings here and then they built the pavilion here. And then in 1922, they built the hall. When they built it, it was to serve the African American community. What there were several different crossroads that happened around this time. It was also a time when black musicians were traveling through the area, could not stay at white establishments, could not play at white establishments. So they were, play, they were coming to places like this and playing. Um, and those people that were traveling around uh, were, you know, Ray Charles, James Brown, Etta James, Guitar Slim, B.B. King, um, Ernie Cato, later on, Professor Longhair, James Booker. All of them, they, they came and they played here. It just, it's incredible that, I mean, every musician who comes on the stage and plays 
says that they can feel that energy from all of the musicians who have come in before us. And I don't know anybody who walks in these doors who doesn't feel that energy. But that energy, this was a black energy center. All of what was done in the African-American community came through this hall. Now this is a story. It's a story that I often say is a much more nuanced story of resilience and self-reliance than you ever hear outside of Mississippi about Mississippi. So this hall in itself contains so much that I began to realize it was bigger than me, bigger than my vision of having a writer's workshop and an artist in residency. It's a place that needs to tell its own story, first of all. And so I resurrected the nonprofit and began operating under the auspices that this was more of a living museum. So our mission right now is to uh, continue the sacred act of presenting live music here. I think it's important to the community, it's important to this hall, it's important to what it was based on. Um, but second, what I wanted to bring to it was a kind of a broader brush of cultural events. And so we had Day of the Dead that was to the Latinx community, done menorah lightings for the Jewish community. We've had, we were gonna do a Diwali fest for the Hindu community. We, um, we do a, a Canaro lighting, a soul for Christmas for the African American community. Um, and we wanted to continue to expand. We do a lot of LGBTQ events um, for the gay community. And this isn't for that community, it's so that we can celebrate and elevate those communities and that cultural difference that we want to celebrate here. Um, so cultural events, music events, and then the community. Of course, we're open for all life events, running for, we've had um, musicians benefits here. We've had repasts here. We've had weddings here, baby showers, baby birthday parties, you know, you name it. And so um, this was the trajectory and the momentum that we were gaining when, of course, the quarantine happened. So. Um, we have decided to close the hall for the rest of the year because we can't imagine how to do community, alcohol, and all of that at the same time under these conditions. But we're, we're definitely monitoring what's going on and um, want to, you know, open as soon as possible. Um, in the meantime, sort of to go back to, to my journey with it, I feel as if this place is bigger than me. It's bigger than anyone owned it, but this shouldn't be. It, I mean, I bought it and was able to buy it because I sold my house in New Orleans and my son and I moved in because Jesse and Carrie, who had owned it before, had built two bedrooms onto the back of it. So I was able to translate my house in New Orleans into a house here. Um, but it's very disconcerting to think that I own it and I could close it tomorrow and turn the hall into my living room. And so this is a cultural um, uh, gemstone, and you know, we don't want to do that. So my vision for the next 10 years is to turn this into a self-sustaining foundation, nonprofit, where I can move out and it's carried on in its tradition to be a community asset. And so the way I'm doing that is to build programming into our functioning. So the first program we developed was in January of 2019, we started the 100 Women DBA, which is a membership organization where uh, members pay dues, and those dues are for the maintenance and preservation of the hall. But our mission is to uplift women of color in Hancock County in business. And we do that in many different ways. Um, we have an application process, and we have been working with some mentees. Um, and we're a mentorship. We're like a knowledge bank of women who are helping women of color in their business and with their business ideas. Um, and we're actually, um, because we can't gather, we've gathered every other month, because we can't gather right now, we've been trying to find a way to continue our work during this time period. And we just, I'm about to send out a press release. This Saturday, we're setting up a listening booth in the yard of the hall. Um, and I don't know if you are familiar with that, but given the spate of killings of black people lately, we're going to set up a listening booth and our members will sit there at one end of a six foot table and people can come at the other end and bring their rage, their outrage, their concern and talk. And this is just um, something that I've done before in New Orleans in community. 
Um, and it's just a place where we can just express what we're feeling about all of this right now. We were going to be doing a community dialogue um, about the young woman who was handed the racist doll in the parade. Um, and the Winter Institute was going to work with us. I've worked with the Winter Institute many times. Um, but that was put on hold because of the quarantine. So 100 Women DBA is one of our programs. Um, the second program is the Musician Cottage. And that is, we had a building that um, was on site and we got a grant from the Mississippi uh, National Heritage Area to refurbish it and convert it into a musician's cottage. We needed a matching grant and we were very fortunate to receive uh, a post electric operating grant from them, uh, the Roundup grant, um, to match those funds. So between those two grants, we were able to finish out this building um, to be a musician's cottage. Now, we hit a glitch, and the glitch was that we had passed through all of our permitting process, everything was a go, when we got to the city council, and unanimously, they declined to look at us as a special use permit even though we have been a special use building for 100 years. They turned down our residency permit. So, Charlie Black was kind enough to let us continue to build the shed out as planned, but now we need to add 300 square feet to make it a residential permit. I actually had a wonderful call today, and I'm very excited to announce that the Mississippi University, Mississippi State University, their architectural program. I spoke to uh, an architect professor there who wants to take it on as a student-led project. And so we're looking at 2021 um, for the university to come together, um, their landscaping department, their architecture department, um, maybe even their history department. They're, one of their architects is traveling around Mississippi with students and their um, cataloging black churches. And, um, and they're a school that definitely um, honors and, and, and intentionally enrolls in, in a um, diversity in mind. And so they're very interested in taking on our project and helping us. So I'm very excited about that. None of this is on my timeline. I'm like, a let's, I want it yesterday. So 2021 just seems like so far off. And I want to get this program going, especially with all of our musicians suffering the way they are. The intent is that we have this building that we can put a musician in there for a respite. But they can come here and stay for a week, or two weeks if they're coming from an international country, you know, coming traveling internationally. They can come here, enjoy Bay St. Louis, use the hall for rehearsal or performance, um, engage deeper into their own music, but also engage with local musicians and even maybe young students, young musicians here. Um, and that the hall continues to foster the music that is part of our culture. Um, this is um, a program that's near and dear to my heart. And so as soon as this can happen, it's gonna happen, but we're making it happen, we're working on it. So that's um, the second big program. And of course the major program here is the maintenance and preservation of the hall. So every music event we do, every rental for the hall, all of that goes into the maintenance and preservation of the hall. Um, we we're very fortunate to have that community grant from the heritage area that allowed us to do the mural on the side of the building, which is a visual storyboard of what the hall's history is, and to also do a portrait program where we took 274 portraits of people who have a history with the hall that we're publishing on our social media platforms and also have collected in a book. And um, so we, um, you know, this place has so much to offer and it has such a big story to tell. And I think that, I don't think that there is a person who's been in here who hasn't felt connected to it and been a part of it. And so my vision is that I have a 10 year tenure with the hall and that by the time I move out of here, it becomes, it belongs to Bay St. Louis as a standalone facility. Um, and so I don't know, how the hell we're going to do that, but these are some ways that I'm trying. So, are there any questions? Um, 
I, I would just like to say that your energy matches the hundred men hall. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I love what you've, how active you've been in the community and what you've done. Um, and in honor of you know, space travel for the first time since 2011, just like all roads to space go through Mississippi, so do all roads to music because I mean, this is the home of the blues, right? Um, and here's a, here's a little tribute to music in space. What kind of music do planets sing? Neptunes. <laughs> Does, do any of you have any questions for Rachel? On that note, Sally has her hand up. <laughs> hand up. Rachel, will you tell our class where the hall is so if they want to drop by and at least see the that fantastic mural on the side of the building um tell them where you're located we are uh well our physical address is 303 union street but we're actually uh, in, in our time and space we're located at the edge of the historic district we're in back of the train depot and um, we're right beside the rail yard so we're um, sort of back of town back of historic district but we are in the historic district um, and so we're around the corner from St. Rose, the, um, the Catholic church that used to serve the African American community exclusively and now is open to everybody. Um, and um, we're three blocks from the beach. And surprisingly, when Katrina hit, we didn't flood. The roof came off, and did a lot of damage, but we're on probably the highest ground in this region. Thank you. Any other questions? Such a rich history with the 100 Men Hall. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing with us today uh, your passion for the 100 Men Hall and for the community. We truly appreciate the time that you've spent with us this afternoon. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question real quick though? I've seen the posters around. We have one of Joan Thomas here in our office, I saw one of Etta May at the Bay St. Louis Little Theater earlier today. Where, how do you get these posters? You said there was a book. How do you get the book? Okay, so the, the portraits um, are online. You know, if you wanted one, you could, you know, um, I, I could send you the digital copy to print it out. Sorry. Um, the posters that you're talking about was for Black History Month. We took 12 of those post subjects and we made them up into a poster honoring um, the African Americans that contributed to Black history and our history here in the community. And we put them all around. That's the one you have in your office. I made duplicates of it to give the individuals themselves. I have a few of them here. I'll be glad to give you some if you want some. We Plan to do this again next year, um, but so I didn't, it wasn't something that I made, and they're like readily available. But I certainly have the digital copy, and you can have them printed. SNL did it for me, so or I have some that you can have too. too. Good. Okay. Anything else? All right, I don't see any other hands. Anne, do you see any other hands out there? All right. All good. <laughs> Great. Well, again, thank you, Rachel. We appreciate you and, and hopefully we'll, we'll be stopping by to see you and purchase some of that merchandise and maybe even a few of us will sign up for uh, some, of those, uh, some of those programs that you have going on. So okay. thank, thank you so much. much. All right, our next speaker uh, doesn't need an introduction. You guys all know and love her very much already because she's been with you through every session. Um, Joy Socher is going to tell us a little bit about generations in the workforce and COVID-19. Joy, take it away.
Joy, I think you may still be muted. Okay, so um, how the screen share work? Um, let's see. So you click the uh, green screen share button at the bottom of the screen. And then no. it'll bring up a dialog box and you choose uh, which window to show. I skipped the step. I there we go. The That's why it didn't work. Okay. Sorry about that. So good afternoon. It's so great to see y'all again. We're going to talk so as we, on the day that we celebrate all our heritage and diversity of our community. It's only fitting that we talk about yet another aspect of diversity and that is generations in the workplace and so the whole reason this information is really just kind of another lens to look at how we differ and and at the end we'll talk about how we're we're the same and but as we go through the same kinds of experiences during the formative years of our life it allows us to form these collective memories and those can drive uh, shared norms shared attitudes behaviors and we start seeing similarities among these generations throughout time. And so currently we do still have five generations in the workforce. We still have um, two to three million traditionalists in the workplace. Uh, they are ages uh, 75 to 100. They're, they're up there, but we still have several million in the workforce. We have the baby boomers, um, which was our biggest generation until just a couple of years ago, but we still have around 40 million of them in the workforce. They're retiring at a, at a very high rate, but we still have 41 million of them in the workforce. The Gen X, born from 65 to 80, they make up about 53 million. There are about 53 million of them in the workforce. Um, the millennials from 81 to 96, and they took over the boomers as the largest portion of the workforce um, a year or two before they were predicted to do so. So they're now our biggest share of the workforce. And then we actually have some of this Generation Z, this last generation uh, with, with a name. Uh, they're, they're aged 8 to 23, so the older part of that generation is already entering into the workforce as well. And so some of the things that we'll talk about some of the events that shape us, but they're also things like our role models, where we the, the role model for women going from June Cleaver to Kim Kardashian, our presidents from FDR, from the scope of FDR's uh, presidency to our first African-American president, Barack Obama, our families going from Lucy and Ricky sleeping in two separate beds to modern families. So those those shared norms are evidenced in pop culture. So our, our oldest generation, the traditionalists, they survived the Great Depression only to enter into World War II, and when their government called, they went. Uh, they, they experienced FDR with his 12 years of pre presidency, the New Deal, Social Security. Um, and so just as they went when their government called them, now in the world of COVID-19, they tend to follow the orders. So they're staying home, they're taking it very seriously. Of course, they're in the most vulnerable age bracket and um, they are very much focused on this as a health event more than it is an economic event for them. And so they are the least likely generation to defy the social distancing orders. Um, they're the least likely to go to a restaurant to eat, to go to a friend's house, to go to a large party. And the only place they differ from their younger generations is voting. They are more likely than any of the generations to go in person to the polls to vote. Remember, this is a patriotic um, generation that respects government and respects order. And you watch that trend go down over the years as, as we go through the generations. But they are the most likely to go get out to the polls in November in person. We have the boomers. So the boomers, the, their parents went when their government called them to World War II. Boomers took a little different approach. When the Vietnam War happened, um, many of them protested. Many of them evaded the, the draft. There was this distrust in government. They lived through the civil rights era and all the change and, and um, turmoil that came with that. 
they saw their very popular president assassinated. And all of these, they survived all these events, and now they're looking at COVID-19 saying, hey, we, we made it through that, we've got this. So some of their, their children are a little concerned about how they're, they're not taking it so seriously, but they feel like they've earned the right to take it how they want to. Um, only 38% of them said they're concerned about the economics of it enough to curb their spending. Um, only 8% are doing more of their shopping online. The rest of them are either doing without or doing it just like they always did. And they too are more likely to vote in person than the younger two generation. And we have Generation X. So this is my generation. And for the first time ever since I started researching a researching generations, um, we're getting talked about for the first time ever because we had the best training ever for the COVID-19 lockdown. We were, so the boomers were the first generation to hit a 50% divorce rate. Many of us were children of divorced parents. Um, we were, and if we weren't, probably both of our parents were. And so we came home with our key around our neck and we let ourselves in and we subsisted on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and we entertained ourselves with four channels, count four channels if we were lucky, radio, and Pong. If you've never, I was going to put up a video of Pong for you, I spared you that, but if you've never seen Pong, you should, you should Google it. There's a little video on YouTube that's fascinating. That was our video game. We would wait with the patience of Joe for our favorite song to come on the radio, just so we could hit record on our cassette recorder and make our own mixtape. We're trained for this quarantine. Um, there's the challenge for Gen X is they find themselves in the middle. So many of us are still caring for kids at home, and yet we have aging parents who we fear aren't taking this, this crisis seriously enough. And then we have the millennials. So millennials um, have tended to have very involved parents that, that scheduled busy lives for them. They scheduled play dates instead of play time. Millennials experience the first real rise in school shootings, and 9-11 and is their big defining moment. Um, this is the COVID-19 situation is their second big economic setback, because many of the millennials were coming into their own during the Great Recession of 2008, and now they're going through this COVID-19, and they're, they're um, disproportionately vulnerable. They are overly represented in the industries that are most affected by the COVID-19 shutdown. Um, they have, uh, many of them still are struggling with student debt. And so you see almost half of them say, we've got to reduce our expenses, we've got to reduce our spend because we're concerned about our finances. And then Generation Z. So we still have, we have a number of these, this generation entering into the workforce. They, um, they saw their parents and then maybe their older siblings struggling to get or keep a job during the recession. And so they tend to be a little distrustful of corporations. This is a much more entrepreneurial generation. They are not just tech savvy, they're tech dependent. They've always had it. They were born social. And, um, you know, experts kind of believe at this point that this COVID-19 is going to be their defining moment to their generation. Unfortunately, half of this, half of the working Gen Zers have either lost their job or had their wages cut. Um, but yet they're a very social generation. Even though they are tech dependent and so much is done on via technology, via digital, they still value face to face. I saw um, an article recently, a gentleman was speaking to a very large group of Gen Z and took a little instant poll of the audience and asked, how do you prefer to be communicated with? How do you prefer to communicate in the work setting? And 72% of them said face-to-face. -face. So um, this is a very social generation. 65% of them say they would hug a friend um, and they continue to interact socially even in the midst of this crisis. And of course, they're in that young Superman mentality as well, where, where this kind of illness it's not affecting their generation as much. And we, we feel invincible at that age, right? So um, 
you know, that's a quick run through of, of all the things, the unique things about each generation. It's a very condensed version of what we normally do. But I thought I'd, I'd end it on the things we have in common. So we talk about the differences, but at the end of the day, we all have, we all share a lot of the same values. We just go about it in a different way. And so, We, this, is, this came out of um, some research done by the Community Leadership Institute. And um, so what they found was we all have similar values. Family is the number one value for across all generations. So we share a lot of the same values. We all want respect. Do you know anybody at any age who doesn't want to be respected? It just may look a little different. So older generations say, I want you to hear my ideas and give them the weight that they deserve. I've done my time, I've learned my lesson, I've, I've learned my job, and I want you to hear me and give it the weight it deserves. Younger generations say, I want you to listen to me. I want you to pay attention to what I have to add and don't discount me just because I'm young or new or um, inexperienced. We all, uh, across all generations, the traits that we consider, uh, that we admire in leadership is, are very common. They're very similar across all generations. And the number one trait that we want in a leader is for them to be trustworthy. It's something that's shared across all generations. Um, contrary to stereotypes that old people resist change and young people embrace it, uh, guys, we all hate change. And so it's just our resistance to it is really dependent upon how much we have to lose, right? It's not an age issue. Loyalty, uh, this is where our younger generations really get dinged for being unloyal. Maybe they're not working the same number of hours as the older folks. Maybe they're job hopping. And it's really a context. So the research that was done in this particular study shows that uh, the number of hours worked had very little to do with how loyal someone felt about the organization and very much to do with their level in the organization. So as they went higher in the organization, their um, hours worked increased. And as far as job hopping, if you think about how millennials and Gen Zers have been brought up, They've always been exposed to so many opportunities, but because of the accessibility of the internet, the world is much bigger than that. They've seen lots more job opportunities, job opportunities that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. And so um, the fact that they have changed jobs or would consider changing jobs is really not that surprising. Um, number six, we all value continuous learning. Everybody wants to learn. Everybody wants the training that's required for them to be good at their job. And last, feedback. And we all value feedback. We want to know that we're doing a good job and we want to know how we can do it better. Uh, it may, we may vary in how we want to receive it and we may vary in the frequency with, what we, with which we want to receive it, but we all value feedback. And so um, just think about all the things we have in common. At the end of the day, we have more in common then we do different and then appreciate the differences. And that's what we're here to do on our Heritage Preservation Day, to appreciate the things that make us unique. Any, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Otherwise, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for Joy about the generations and how they're handling COVID and why? Yeah, I, th I think there's certain baseball players who also were prepared for COVID-19. The catcher, because he only works from home. But in Put him, okay, so. <laughs> Um, our next speaker also does not need an introduction. Um, he's in your class, so you see him 
once a month at least, and we'll be graduating with him hopefully soon in the near future. And Steve Barney. Uh, thanks. Uh, Maria, I just wanted to say thank you to you and uh, Vicki and Sally and everybody for um, allowing me the opportunity to participate. And I, I like what you've done with your hair, Maria. It's beautiful. <laughs> Um, Nan, I know you've got my PowerPoint presentation, but I'd like to try to see if I could uh, share my, my screen here. Is that something I can try to do? Yeah, you just click the up. Oh, you're good. We see it. Okay, let me just go into... Um, there you go. You've got mode. it. Yeah, okay. So, let's see. I'm trying to get it in slideshow mode here. Just give me a second and we'll get synchronized okay so uh i just want a little bit about me this is uh trying to focus on some of the other artists in the area uh, a lot of people are familiar with what i've done but i uh been playing with clay breaking things since i was a kid growing up in buffalo new york um i have a uh, degree in electrical engineering and computer science and worked 25 years as a uh, technology consultant in new england uh, Jazz Fest brought me down to New Orleans for decades, and about six years ago, I moved to Bay St. Louis. Um, I'm probably most well known for uh, founding the Steampunk Pottery Project. It is a method to teach about science and engineering through the experience of making pottery. I'm not going to talk a lot about my Mad Potter of Bay St. Louis gig, but um, I'm able to travel to schools, libraries, museums, and festivals around the area. Uh, if you're interested, try Googling upside down potter. You might be amazed what you see there. Um, a few years ago, I bought a dilapidated old industrial complex in Bay St. Louis, and I've established the Bay St. Louis Creative Arts Center and building a community maker space. Um, up till 2017, I had zero experience in nonprofit management and kind of have learned uh, it's been an interesting uh, path here as I spent the last two years as president of the Arts Hancock County and um, have become executive director of the Arts Hancock County. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the Arts Hancock County and what we do. Um, our mission is to promote, enhance, and support the arts in Hancock County. We're committed to equality and seeking out un underrepresented populations. As we integrate art into the fabric of our community, we're inclusive of all artists, visual artists, performing artists, writers, artisans, and art supporters. Through our year-round programming, we to support and promote local artists, encourage and inspire future artists, and work to foster a deeper appreciation of all the diverse forms of art within the community. Uh, we provide a wide range of community resources develop and promote both established and emerging artists, providing a foundation for a robust and growing what we call creative economy, uh, which obviously has a lot to do with tourism. Um, we've put together a five-year plan really focused on the three principles of impact, placemaking, and uh, sustainability. Um, we're really looking at how can we increase our impact to the health and vitality of our community through the expansion of our programming, uh, advocacy work, and really priority on reaching out to underserved members of the uh, community. Um, so how do we make uh, an impact? We're trying to figure out what a local art association should be. We're going through trying to engage community input in that. If you have any ideas about what you think an art association means to the community, please let me know. Historically, our Arts Alive Festival has been our major event of the year. Uh, the differentiator of that festival is our focus on hands-on activities and experiences, um, and with a strong focus on uh, maker activities for kids. Um, we have been working to expand our year-round programming, juried exhibition, under the flower moon. We have events going on 12 months of the year. Uh, we've recently integrated student interns into our association. The next part of our really our strategic plan is with, what I think about is uh, placemaking. Uh, Bay St. Louis describes itself as a place of art. Uh, I would like to argue that it is a place of art. So 
think about how can arts and culture across Hancock County instill a sense of place, create vibrancy and stimulate the local economy and connect us to one another. So, you know, we do this placemaking by expanding our public art initiatives, um, increasing uh, opportunities for artists to exhibit their work, increasing the visibility of our organization. Um, certainly there's a huge opportunity to do creative placemaking at the depot. We're working with 18 other municipal agencies in Bay St. Louis and Hancock County to go after uh, $2 million of grant funding from uh, BP with uh, $400,000 from the city of Bay St. Louis. We're also pursuing some National Endowment of the Arts funding for the Depot District as well. Um, we see a tremendous opportunity to expand creative placemaking in Coleman Avenue with the newly established Studio Waveland. And also we think there's a huge opportunity to promote this area for snowbirds and folks to come here for artist residencies and workshops and stay in the VRBOs and um, have a real uh, unique Bay St. Louis, Hancock County experience. The last part of our strategic plan is really how do we transition from a volunteer run organization to a sustainable business model? How do we enhance our board? How do we have paid staff? How do we grow our revenue stream? But most importantly, how do we increase our capacity to deliver programs to the public? So we have been working to be locally uh, designated local art agency of record. We've received those designations in the last 12 months from Bay St. Louis, Diamond Head, and Waveland, and we're hoping to do that um, with a board of supervisors as well. Um, I've stepped into the newly established role of executive director with a part-time stipend. Um, we are building our board membership. We have a great board now, but always looking to enhance it. Um, and we're beginning to pursue more operational and project grants. We've uh, now submitted a grant to the Mississippi Arts Commission, which is uh, being evaluated and we're, we're hopeful for that. So, I mean, that's the background about uh, the arts organization, but you know, it really does not answer the question of what is it about Bay St. Louis that makes it this funky little town? You ask people to talk, why, why is it, it's hard to put a finger on. And, you know, I felt like that this was an important thing to try to talk with a leadership class about, to try to present, because I think that there's uh, behind the scenes, a couple dozen people who are working tirelessly on a volunteer basis to do all these cool things. And so um, what I've done is I put together a, a video where I went and interviewed uh, 12 different people um, and we created these little vignettes. And I think by looking at the vignettes, we can, um, we can help tell the story a little bit here. So uh, Maria, if, if I could, I'd like to um, uh, show a couple of these videos, if that's okay. Um, so I've loaded some of these videos. Steve, Steve yeah. I'm sorry. We're gonna let Ann run the videos because she's got okay. them ready. And we're, Perfect. Gonna, we're gonna listen to Mitchell and then I think that'll take our time. And then if we have time at the end, after our next speaker, we might be able to hear some others. But we're gonna start with Mitchell and Ann's gonna run that for us. Okay, thank you. Thanks. to a blown glass and glass casting studio, as well as about 30 artist spaces. And then I moved into uh, St. Bernard Parish for a few years, and now happily I'm uh, here in Waveland, Mississippi. Studio Waveland at 228 Coleman Avenue, which was a building built to spur economic development, interest in, in the city, kind of business incubator for Waveland. So when we looked at it, it was like an epiphany. The building, uh, the people, the government here was so conducive for us. So we envisioned this as kind of a arts campus of sorts, gallery, 
workshops, our workshops, our studios, as well as uh, working with other artists, the existing arts community in, in, in Bay St. Louis and stuff, and really making this kind of like a hub uh, to give Waveland a little bit of an identity, you know, to give us a home and, the, and just another component to the existing arts community. Generate your own gravity, you know, uh, and people will find you. This is, would be a great place for us to anchor our lives, you know, and to, to, to pull down a little bit of the arts community into Waveland, Mississippi. We've done large scale architectural walls at the Bio Innovation Center in New Orleans, a 10 by 40 foot wall. Uh, we were in, uh, both me and Erica were involved in putting pieces up into a park that commemorated the uh, Irish immigrants in the city of New Orleans. We did the glass components for a Catholic church in Osaka, Japan. We also teach a lot, you know, and we taught for five years at a school in Istanbul, Turkey. I've taught at the school in Toyama, Japan, in Fraunau, in uh, field work, the school in Fraunau, Germany and stuff, and Red Deer in Canada. So Pilchuk School of Glass. So that's been also this incredible important component of my life is teaching is where you tend to learn a lot and just getting out of your little you know cave sometimes is a great thing but a lot of people have definite stereotypes in mind when they think of artists as business people and as an industry but you know the cultural arts you know make up so much uh, industry and it's uh, you know just with music and computer arts and graphics and design and, and visual arts what you know what me and Eric can do what we love about this is we're able to showcase the gallery the working I mean how you know the what, what it takes to do it you know so this building we see that as a function of showing the industry of visual arts you know so along with that I have a production line which is just kind of you know I enjoy designing a $20 object, you know, that's a souvenir, you know, I mean, I like that aspect of it. I use a lot of that stuff in my work. And then my work uh, has different components, you know, uh, but one component that has been important to me lately is, dis is, is discussing gun violence. It's easy for me to tread the line between designing a $20 object to commemorate the new lighthouse in Waveland or to talk about how 12,830 people a year are killed on average in the United States with guns. For me to just to move my stuff here, you know, I basically hired a door company to cut a roll up door. My wife is working on a steel piece. She's working with a metal company to fabricate and cut out the steel components that she's going to weld and stuff. We've already set up accounts, you know, with local you know, oxygen tank and, and oxyacetylene tank people, Kentwood water, you know. So, so the, the building of your studio draws from non-cultural assets. All of these small galleries in Bay St. Louis, ceramic studios, I mean, they lend a little bit of identity, of uniqueness to a community. They're still living on the legacy of George Orr and uh, Walter Anderson, you know, I mean, the impact that those people had, those two people had on their community, I mean, they've been dead a long damn time, and it still resonates. It's still a tourist-based industry created by that. When we do art openings, when we work, you know, with what's going on in Bay St. Louis, you know, coordinated art openings, I think that, you know, rising tide floats all boats. So many of our friends from New Orleans have come to visit us, have come here to see us and then discover this area. They're not coming here to go to the Super Walmart. There's already one in Chalmette, you know. They're gonna come here for that unique experience. Yeah, that was Mitchell Godet, uh, who's just moved his studio here with his uh, wife, uh, Erica Larkin. And uh, it was just a fascinating experience to be able to interview all these folks. Um, I will make sure to provide links to those other five videos that people can see them. I encourage people to, uh, to look at them. All right, um, Steve, you've done some great work not just in the community, but in putting all of that together for us. And we'll look forward to watching the rest of uh, those interviews that you've put together for us. In the meantime, does anybody have any questions for Steve? All right. If not, I think our mm -hmm. next, yep, sorry. Tish. So Steve, great job as usual. 
So tell me, what about Arts Alive? What's going to happen with that? Well, so, you know, I've, we're following guidance from, you know, all the, the, the folks, the leadership from uh, the state government on down. Right now, we are tentatively set to execute this in the weekend of September 19th and 20th, and we're just kind of in a, in a holding pattern and hoping to execute it in some form, even if it means a, a socially distanced form, but we want to do an event in September if we can, Tish. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, I, I think we have our next speaker on the line. Um, we were going to talk to John Anderson from the Bay St. Louis Little Theater, but we've got Clayton Penny Legion uh, also with the Bay St. Louis Little Theater. And, and Clayton is a celebrity as well, um, <laughs> doing many stage and theater uh, movie productions. So uh, pretty honored to have a, an actual IMDB uh, participant on our call with us today. So Clayton, <laughs> Uh, tell us what you know about the Little Theater. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for asking us to join you. Um, I'm standing out here in front of the Star Boarding House, which also is uh, known by an alias of the Bay St. Louis Little Theater. Now, the reason for the two names, the original Bay St. Louis Little Theater was located on Broadman Street, north of Highway 90, just off of the Bay. It was founded in 1944 was completely demolished in Hurricane Katrina. A couple of years later, members of the original theater company were able to purchase uh, this building and turn it into a theater. But before that happened, in 1965, a major motion picture called This Property is Condemned was filmed here. It's based on a, a one-act play by Tennessee Williams. And in the movie, a family named Star, S-T-A-R-R, -R, um, a widow and her daughters, owned a boarding house in town that was home to some of the main characters in the story. Well, the uh, film company used this building as the Star boarding house. Uh, they decorated it a bit, did some exterior scenes here, and this building was featured in that film. It starred Natalie Wood, Robert Redford, Charles Bronson, Kate Reed, and some other actors. You'll probably have to look them up on Wiki or IMDb, um, as most of them are no longer active. Uh, and so uh, we, when the building was renovated and turned into the theater, the theater kept the name of Star Boarding House. The other thing they kept, if you'll follow me, notice the red door at the entrance. The original theater on Boardman had a bright red door, and I said uh, was demolished. But to keep that tradition alive, our door here is red. And if you'll follow me on the inside, we'll take a quick tour. Lone surviving artifact from the original theater. This was a banner. Um, it is a, a play of some sort. It is the classic comedy and tragedy mask, Vespas and Melpomene. And this was found in the mud where the original theater used to be. As you can see, the founding date was 1946. Now, so much for the theater and the Star Boarding House. The building here was originally a um, family-owned uh, general market, owned, built and owned by the Scafidi family. Mr. Scafidi immigrated from Italy early in the 1900s. He was a stonemason, worked his way around the coast, settled here in the area, and built this. The main floor was the general store. We'll take you into the other room to show you where the market was. And then the family lived upstairs. The residential rooms are up there. All of this was commercial space. We're in the main lobby. If you'll follow me, we'll go on into the auditorium.
Now, our theater's last performance here was in late January. After that show wrapped, uh, we cleaned up a little bit and started getting ready for our next show. We cast, um, started some preparation, and then, of course, everything had to be shut down. So what you're seeing is mi the midway transition from one show to another. But this large, great room, which is where we have our stage and our audience, was the original market. And over on the outside, there's a row of doors. This was uh, open for customers. And if you'll notice in the back, that gray area, those were barn doors where merchandise could be brought in on a cart for the store here. Now, our risers and chairs, all of this is movable. And we have used those doors on occasion. But most of the time, they're not needed, so we're laid out like this. The, um, the building was purchased and renovated with some very generous grants from the Department of Mississippi Department of Archives. And, uh, and one of the conditions for the grant was that we maintain the architectural integrity of the original building. Well, the original building here in the main uh, uh, sales route had these three pillars that supported the upper floor. And because they were original, we, um, we have had to maintain them. We're working on that today. <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> sometime later in the year, a partial solution will be us in this. Here's our stage. Uh, this is what's left of one set and partially the transition to another. We can see generously 80 people, and if the crowd is large and um, enthusiastic, we can bring it up to 100 if the fire marshal isn't here. <laughs> Coming on around, let's take a quick trip upstairs to see what the family quarters were like. Now, from what I've seen in the census records in the early, mid-1900s, the Scafidi family at one point numbered about 13 individuals in three generations. And uh, a large family, Mr. Scafidi worked with his business and as he was able, he brought other family members. And it sounds like 13 in one household, sounds like a lot. But when we get upstairs, there are eight large bedrooms. There really was a lot of room upstairs. Come with me. This is the great room upstairs. It's directly over what is now our lobby. And this was also the family's private entrance. There's an a balcony and an outside set of stairs. They could come and go privately here without having to go through the store lobby downstairs. Uh, this is where, well, obviously, it's where we store a lot of stuff. All of the rooms up here are storage mostly, but this is where our cast during the performance will hang out. They'll wait here until it's time to go on stage. And then the room is filled with various set pieces that we use, things that were donated, some artifacts, some, some nice donations. We have Elvis, uh, we have Elvis Clinton in the background, Charlie Chaplin over in the corner. They never performed here, but they would have if they had known about us. Coming back out. Into the lobby. Now that space would have been the family's living room, kitchen, and dining area. And then starting around here are the eight bedrooms. We've got them filled with props and set pieces, but there's this large number of connected bedrooms. This room is one of two on the upper floor that has a private balcony. And all of the bedrooms going around this way interconnect. There are doors linking all of them. Now, 
This is the largest of the bedrooms. This is the one in the center. Here at the end, another large room uh, with also with a private balcony. Another room, this is what we use for the men's dressing room. This is the smallest bedroom, but even so, this room would have been adequate for two people, maybe more. Probably children, I would guess. And again, notice the interior doors that connect each room to the next. This would have been another master bedroom, probably for uh, the grandparents. And the attic upstairs is just an attic. Um, nothing up there except a uh, floor joist and insulation and air conditioning. We'll skip that part. <laughs> this is a painting of the original theater uh, as it used to appear over on Boardman. It was two Quonset huts uh, brought together and um, renovated to be one theater. And as I said, after Katrina, it was just scraped off the face of the earth. Nothing remains. They say most of, yeah, let's head on back downstairs. What are like? Okay. Okay. The early night, uh, 2000s. Wait. When, uh, they, so. Hey, Clayton. It's yes, ma'am. It's getting a little bit hard to hear. Do you think maybe oh, we can start taking some questions? Absolutely. Be delighted to. All right. And I'll stay closer to the camera so you can hear me better. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for Clayton about the BSL Little Theater and how much it means to the community and why? Well, and starting, um, in 2010, the theater reopened. Uh, three or four key members of the original company kept it together, were able to purchase this property. The day they went to settlement, literally there were bulldozers on the property ready to destroy it. But they were able to purchase it, renovate it. We've been going now for 10 years. This fall, we'll start our 10th season. Uh, we do about six shows a year and three or four special events. And it is the only live theater uh, here in Bay St. Louis. We've been generously supported by um, the city government and our mayor, former mayor, and um, our audiences. Most of our audiences are um, subscription members. So we have uh, typically a good turnout. We do a variety of shows each year to appeal to a broad spectrum of the public. Mostly we aim for the quality shows, Pulitzer Prize winners, things like that. Occasionally we do some experimental things. We've even turned around our theater completely where we put the audience on stage and had the actors out in the area where the, uh, the audience now sits. So we're Wait, always- can I, can I ask a question? Sure, please. Since we're coming to the end of our time, could you tell us what y'all's plans are for next season, if you know yet? We are waiting for word when we can reopen. Um, we had two or three shows still in the works at the time of the shutdown. We have not canceled them. So as soon as we get the word that we can reopen, we will begin rehearsal on our next two shows and finish our original season and then sometime in the fall, we will reopen the 2020-2021. Uh, okay, um, thank you. And we'll be back on schedule for a full six shows a year. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're so grateful that you've been able to join us today and, and uh, appreciate the time that you spent preparing and, and taking us on this tour of the Star Boarding House uh, and the story behind it, definitely love how it ties into uh, Bay Saint and, and our rich com community uh, culture. So with that bringing us close, to, uh, bringing us to the end, are there any questions anybody has for um, Clayton or Sally or Steve 
or myself, Tish is still on the line. I want to ask everyone to unmute yourself. You feel so far away. So if you un unmute yourself, and then you can not only ask questions, but you know at the end of every session, we ask you for feedback. So Maria, would it be okay if we just open it up not only for questions, but also for some feedback for today? Sure. And, and uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna preface that with, I wanna thank Maria and Vicki for trying to take a day's worth of information and topics and condense it into two hours. I, I feel like we've sped through the, the agenda, but we had no choice. So, you know, we, we, we're all kind of frustrated with that situation. But I'm just gonna first open it up to any questions or feedback and Maria, you can also jump in. Okay. And I'd also like to add, I did unmute all the phone lines. So if you're connected by phone, feel free to jump in the dialogue. And since we ended on art history and culture in, in Bay St. Louis, I just wanted to know if you guys heard anything about the artist that took things too far. It, it turns out she didn't know where to draw the line. <laughs> she definitely needs a drum roll. <laughs> we need sound effects. So anyone have any feedback to offer? Questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, you can still jump in, but before we close it, I want to tell you a couple of things. Graduation, we're not going to be able to have it, <coughs> excuse me, on June the 2nd. See, I'm all ch choked up now. The steering committee is talking about maybe having a celebration of maybe a fun party later in the summer. Um, we've just started thinking about this, where it would be maybe at the Silver Slipper downstairs. You could bring a guest. It would be fun. We'd do graduation. Any uh, thoughts about that right now? Y'all like that idea? That sounds good to me. Well, think about it, and if you come up with any other ideas, let us know, or any thoughts. You've got my email. You can email me or Janelle. Um, the other, we are accepting, going to start accepting applications for leadership for next year's class, and we will be accepting those in June and July. What will next year look like? We don't really know, but we're going to go ahead and accept applications. And we will just have to do the planning as we get closer toward August, September. So we really don't know, but um, you know, spread the word. We'll be posting that as well. What else, Maria, Vicky, and Tish? Class. Nobody's saying. I hope you guys have gotten a little bit of a feel for the culture and, and why it's so important to hold on to the heritage that we have in, in, in Hancock County. Um, I know being a transplant into the area, I, I just love uh, how much the arts is part of um, who we are in Bay St. Louis. And like I said earlier, um, this is definitely the secret coast and while I want people to visit, I hope none of them figure out how great it is to live here because uh, it's our little secret. Wish my name was Victoria at the moment. Just kidding. <laughs> I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so we did say this would go from three to five. So I'm going to ask Terry Hilliard if she will lead us in a closing prayer. But um, if you would like to stay on the line and chat hey there's one thing i want to say this, this is raymond hey, raymond. Hancock whitney is doing mass giveaway at the 90 branch if anybody needs mass. they're uh blue cloth masks they're reusable um, just under the page and I'll get you. that's great i'll also follow up with that if you, your business needs masks for your employees 
if you will email me the number of employees you have. Uh, we have a whole mask making factory in Bay St. Louis. It's but it's and there's no charge to your business, but they can provide masks for your employees. And if you will just email me your um, business and the number of employees. And anybody else before we turn it over to Terry? Thank you, Raymond. And again, if anyone wants to stay on the line after the prayer um, and chat, that's fine. So Terry? Terry, we can't hear you. Andy, see if she's muted or anything? Um, she appears to be unmuted. Hmm. Well, and let me just say, Terry has just gotten a new assignment, and we really appreciate her leadership she has shown in our community, and we're so proud to have her as part of this class, and we know that, you know, God has his plan in store for her, but we're glad that he brought her here to Hancock County for the time that we've had her here. Um. Any ideas, Anne, to help uh, her? Let's see. She appears to be coming in on her phone as well. Okay. Mute. Okay. Now you can hear. Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah. Thank you. we want to be mindful of everyone's time uh, but if you have uh, a prayer concern that you just want to unmute real quick and share with the group I want to give you an opportunity to do that all right hearing none let us pray Gracious God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for this class. And even as it has been disrupted, like much of our lives have been disrupted, we know that you are present um, and that we are still gleaning information that we can uh, share with those that we come in contact with and in our businesses uh, and in our lives. We give thanks for this class and its leadership. I pray for those who have been on this class and this call, uh, this Zoom, uh, this afternoon, I pray that they would feel your presence and your peace and that you would go before us in the days ahead until we meet again. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all so much for staying with us. Um, I know it's never easy to, to be on a call for two hours and not be able to talk. So uh, we do appreciate you and everything that you do in our community, mm -hmm. um, in your business, in your family uh, and, and just how big of a part you are for uh, Hancock County. So thank you all very much. Vicki? Yep, thank you so much, class. And stay posted because we're gonna have a celebration this summer, we hope. And look, this Friday we have another Zoom for our Chamber Spin at 10. And we're going to be featuring an architect friend of the Andersons. And just a little shout out to John and Allison. They um, just received a national award. They were recognized with the 2020 AIA Committee on the Environment Top 10 Award. This is the nation's wow. highest recognition for design excellence and building performance. And the first project awarded in the state of Mississippi for this honor. So congratulations, that's for the Marine Education Center. Congratulations, and I'm sure we're gonna hear more about this on the Friday Spin at 10. <laughs> Woohoo, that's great. Thank y'all. <laughs> so until um, we run into each other in the community or we see you at our graduation party, thanks for being here today. And y'all all take care and stay safe. Okay. And stay on and talk. Bye. The show must go on. <laughs> <laughs>
I do encourage you to check out the other videos that Steve has. So there's some other really cool artists. Yeah, I'll make sure yeah. to send out those links, uh, Sally. I'll send them to Ann and maybe she can forward them on to the group. Okay. Yeah, I'll be happy to. You did okay. a really great job with those videos. And we especially appreciated Mitch's because he makes a really good connection between art and business and it's important to the economy. You know, it's yeah. a lot of times people will think about arts as just a quality of life concern, but they really are an economic driver, especially for our community. Yeah, and I, that's what I was really trying to get at. Um, and I'm really happy that you guys went through all the videos and looked at them. I think that these, you know, leadership was the reason why I created these videos, but it's got a bigger life of its own, I think, in terms of uh, helping promote the area, in terms of economic development, relocation, all those things. So I'm um, really excited about it. I really liked them because they all had real different focuses. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Ann and I listened to all of them and we were like, okay, which ones we, do we pick? And, you know, there were three of them that we wanted to show and um, the, the focuses are really different. Cats was very interesting and some of and they're most of them are shorter than Mitch's most of them are like two and three minutes and you can listen to them very quickly I also wanted to say Maria the video of St. Rose mm -hmm. I felt like I was there I mean you that was really great and thank you for making that special effort that was really good my pleasure I love the wigs too Maria <laughs> Well, you got to take advantage of a drag queen when you got them, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, I think the my were my favorite. Yeah. yeah. The blue one. That was, that was good. The cotton candy. Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> he might actually do a turn mom into a drag queen one day <laughs> on, yeah. on Facebook Live or something. That might be a thing that we do. That would be hilarious. Do it, do it, do it. Now, Raymond, the is are the the lobbies are now open? Yes, ma'am. We opened last Monday. Okay, I knew ours here was open, but okay. Yeah. So, and you can just come in and ask for mask. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We got three thousand to give away. Oh wow, that's great. Yeah. So come get your some. So at any branch. Hmm. Yeah, no, just the Bay 90 branch. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, just our branch. They're using us as a pilot branch to see how it works. Okay. So y'all have 3,000 there to give away? Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. No. Dinner's ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's the heat press. <laughs> I'm headed to I'm headed, I have another Zoom at six, talking about how to reopen and all those issues around that, the new church I'm at. Terry, tell us about your new church. Where are you? I'm at, what are you doing? I'm at Heritage United Methodist on Pops Ferry in D'Iberville. Okay. Okay. Gulfside has um, hired uh, one of the board members as an interim. Um, I'm working on one last project with Gulfside, but I'm no longer employed with them at all and still trying to finish the quote unquote transition to the new person. Um, got a voicemail from her a little while ago that it would be later tonight before I get there. Um, so, so my commute of about four minutes went to 76 miles round trip. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you because I knew you just got that place on over there. Yeah, I mean, we're not moving, even if, you know, because Larry's a Methodist preacher too. So even if um, we wind up in however many years having to serve somewhere else, we're not getting rid of our house. I mean, that's that's going to be the place that we uh, hopefully live out our lives at, unless, you know, a need for family somewhere else takes us somewhere else. But no, we're not. In the event of an emergency, I know a great realtor. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I've had enough emergencies in the last two and a half three years of my life that I don't really uh thank you but I'm hoping there won't be any more emergencies <laughs> <Heard> that. <laughs> that's for sure um 
but you know, I'm, I'm behind all the pastors who've been dealing with COVID for weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, and their church is talking about things. This church was without a pastor for about a month, month and a half. And so they did online services, just the lay people did them and, and everything, you know, on their own, but, but they weren't having pointed conversations about how to deal with when we come back together and how to do that and when. And so we're just kind of behind the curve, but it's good. Well, it's great that you're going back to ministry. I've really appreciated the ending on a, it with a prayer from you at the last two classes. You're so yeah. I appreciate that. Um, our worship service on online this, uh, this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. So if you're a church goer, you know, Pentecost is a big deal. Um, but it's, it's some of us, but then there is, uh, scripture reading and music, even children, but of pastors and clergy throughout the Mississippi conference have all come together and put together a Pentecost service. Um, and we'll be, we'll be doing it on our Facebook page this weekend. And so it's just really neat. You know, it's the birthday of the church, but it's people of all ages and races and gender and everything all doing the service together. And it's just a great picture of what the church ought to be. It's what we need right now. A little unity in our yeah. divided world and literally separated world. I guess there's no, I, I see Annie's still on the phone. Is Kevin yeah. still? There's no um, information yet about school where we're headed with schools, is there? Did we lose Annie? I think we might have lost Annie, but oh, Kevin's Kevin. still with us. There you are. Uh, all I can tell you right now, I just returned to work today. I'm on the floor of my contract. So um, we're working, you know, Hancock is doing a lot of construction right now. So we kind of don't know what that's going to look like in a few months. So, um, more to follow, pretty much. Yeah, we did do a great, great tribute to our seniors. Y'all have been right. watching. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. I mean, our principal, our staff. I couldn't. I couldn't imagine. Um, those people worked at four thirty in the morning to get that up. Wow. I mean, all night to get it up, and uh, they just did a great job. They took their time. And I'm very proud to be a part of Hancock High School. Um, our principal, our, our uh, assistants, and all of the people that, uh, that helped that, 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 I mean, I told them you could call me, um, but they, they didn't call anybody. They had a certain group. They went out there and they worked all night and they got those photos up and that was very special for those kids. Um, we're looking, I think, around June 18th, maybe doing a, uh, some type of something uh, of a semblance of a graduation. Don't know how that's going to look, um, but I'm excited. Uh, and those kids deserve it um, as well. Uh, and we, my program is looking to uh, hopefully, hopefully include eighth graders next year. Uh, so we're getting... Uh, like very close to the middle school to to improve our program and to also uh, have some uh, some dialogue with the eighth graders as well before they so they won't just actually just be total culture shock when they come to the high school but that's more as a pilot program that the army starting uh, if we get selected to do it uh, and I'm trying to be a part of we're trying to be a part of the pilot program but. We're just in a preliminary stages of that. They just kind of put that out. Um, but um, nothing, really nobody knows what's going to gonna happen uh, as far as getting back to school. At least I have not heard. I know there's probably discussions going on and courses of action being put together on what we possibly could do. But I'm just hoping and praying that we can get back. I'm ready to get back already. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that our kids understand because they've had to deal with um, being away from their friends, 
being away from their teachers. And I think they are kind of appreciate their teachers. They appreciate coming to school. And uh, these things will give you an appreciation when it's taken away. So um, we'll see how that turns out. I'm hoping it will be, be good. I'm hoping it will be a good experience for the kids. Yeah. Okay. Well, it looks like most people have said goodbye. So yeah. um, anything else? Bye. Anyone? We'll say goodbye. Okay. Um, bye bye. Bye, Kevin. Thank you. See you later this summer. And if the steering committee who's still on there and Ann could stay for just a minute. Okay.